Olivia was born to a British patent attorney and his wife on July 1, 1916, in Tokyo, Japan. De Havilland's parents divorced when she was only three. Her mother migrated to Los Angeles, taking along Olivia and a second child. The baby sibling would grow up to be Oscar-winning actress Joan Fontaine, but the theatrical bug bit her older sister first. After graduating from high school, de Havilland enrolled in Mills College in Oakland. It was at Mills that she participated in the school's production of A Midsummer Night's Dream and was spotted by the great director-producer Max Reinhardt. Olivia was so impressive that Reinhardt cast her in his stage production and then again for the film version. Though she initially signed a five-year contract with Warner Brothers instead of the standard seven, de Havilland was still concerned about making such a long commitment. Warners wouldn't let me play Hermia in Midsummer Night's Dream unless I agreed to sign a long-term contract, which I didn't want to do. Um, I wanted to go to Mills College and or go, you know, continue in the theater. But Reinhardt was thought me most unreasonable, and he backed me into the office of the casting director, and and I said, well, not seven years, five years, five years, and and they said, well. Okay, five years, so I just signed for five instead of seven. But as soon as the ink dried on the contract, Olivia made three more pictures. The first two were forgettable. My second film was in Alibi Ike, which was a baseball picture with a famous uh, comic actor, Joey Brown, mm -hmm. um, as, as the star. But I wasn't too happy in Alibi Ike. Then came The Irish in this. And what was rather pleasant about that film was that Jimmy Cagney was in it. And he had played Bottom, of course, in Midsummer Night's Dream. And we'd become mm -hmm. friends on that film. He was always so nice to me. Then came the third film, where she was teamed with the leading man with whom she'd be most often associated. Captain Blood was a huge hit, and so were its co-stars. It's the world against us, and us against the world. Those of you in favor of these articles, raise your right hands and say aye! aye! Wickedly handsome Errol Flynn was a female heartthrob on screen, a notorious womanizer off screen. True to form, he pursued his young and still innocent leading lady. She steadfastly resisted any romantic involvement because he was a married man. But her deep infatuation for Flynn endured a long time. Errol and Olivia would make a total of eight pictures together. I've seen your parrot ways. I've seen myself bargain for and fought over a combat between jackals. You pirates are used to taking what you want without the formality of purchase. I'm thief and pirate, and I'll show you how a thief and a pirate can deal. I advise you to go back to your ladies at Tortuga, who are thrilled by your bold, lawless ways. What matters is that now I own you as once you own me. You're mine, do you understand? Mine to do with as I please. In 1936, de Havilland was paired with the talented Frederick March. March was extraordinary. But Olivia would have preferred Errol Flynn for the title role in Anthony Adverse. Angela! Angela! Angela, you can't go. You mustn't go. Anthony, I you... must. No, you... <laughs> she was back in Flynn's arms for the charge of the Light Brigade. The Light Brigade rides again, and a glorious story lives again, sweeping you across thousands of miles of Asia, from the battlefield of Balaclava to the historic Khyber Pass. You're the only thing that's real here. All I know is that I'm holding you in my arms. It's you're so lovely. As a romantic screen team, Olivia and Errol's most memorable moments would not be dancing, but riding alongside the men of Sherwood Forest in the adventures of Robin Hood. England, in the gallant days when history hung on the flight of an arrow or the slash of a sword, when feudal barons ravaged the countryside to live in pomp and splendor, when one man alone dared challenge the might of his country's oppressors, Robin Hood, outlaw of Sherwood Forest and his stalwart band, robbing the rich to feed the poor, ready to fight for king, for country, or for maiden fair. Well, this forest is wide. It can shelter and clothe and feed a band of good determined men. Good swordsmen, good archers, good fighters. Are you with me? It's Errol Flynn as Robin Hood. Olivia de Havilland as Maid Marion. Claude Rains, Basil Rathbone, and a cast of thousands. 
reliving history's most colorful adventure. I suppose you realize the penalty for killing a king's deer is death. Are there no exceptions? Will you come with me? To Sherwood? I have nothing to offer you but a life of hardship and danger, but we'd be together. Because I love you, Robin, I'd come. Even the danger would mean nothing if you were with me. Let me ram those words down his throat, Your Highness. From this night on, I use every means in my power to fight you. After Maid Marian and Robin Hood rode off happily ever after, de Havilland continued in a series of standard leading lady roles that brought her all the benefits of stardom. Still, she longed for a breakout part. The entire film industry was buzzing about who would be cast in the motion picture event of the decade, if not all time. It seemed that every actress in Hollywood was vying for the coveted role of Scarlett O'Hara in Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind. Everyone except Olivia. She was determined to play the sweet yet unintentional thorn in Scarlet's side, Melanie Wilkes. I had been playing ingenues, and their experience is very limited as characters in a film. Uh, they meet the hero, the hero uh, and, and the heroine, or the, the um, ingenue, fall in love, or they don't fall in love, but eventually they fall in love, and then the hero pursues the ingenue, and will she say yes, or will she not say yes? Will her parents give consent? There are all these obstacles. And then finally, they get together, and you know they're going to sweep off into the sunset. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all there is to it. But Melanie went through a whole war. She went through childbirth. She died. Uh, she, she went through all kinds of experiences, and this was a rich human uh, 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 life to interpret. To Havilland's boss, Jack Warner, had no intention of lending her to producer David O. Selznick for a mere supporting role. Warner didn't count on Olivia's resolve. In time, he would learn to regret his tendency to underestimate her persistence. De Havilland began to rankle over playing standard ingenue roles. Her dissatisfaction was beginning to show in her work attitude. I always thought of it as a kind of, well, it was a prison. And Jack was the warden. All of us, all of us actors, we were the inmates. And sometimes we were put into solitary confinement. That was suspension. And sometimes we were let out on parole, and that was when we were loaned to another studio. And so finally the warden agreed to let me out on parole, and I went over to David Selznick's to make Gone with the Wind on parole. But a deal was finally made for Olivia to join the cast of Gone with the Wind, co-starring with Vivian Lee, Clark Gable, Leslie Howard, and Hattie McDaniel. De Havilland forever joined the annals of film history in one of the most talked about movies of the 20th century. She was also nominated for a Best Supporting Actress Oscar for her portrayal of the noble and long-suffering Melanie. But she lost to her fellow co-star, Hattie McDaniel, who would be the first black performer to be so honored. After all the acclaim over Gone with the Wind, it was difficult for De Havilland to return to simply being Errol's eternal damsel in distress. At least Santa Fe Trail added another man to the romantic mix. Ronald Reagan lost to Haviland to Flynn in that one. Why, Joe, there's something missing. Must be me. Hello. Hello, what are you doing here? Oh, playing nursemaid for those wagons. Should be the other way around. Oh, the convoy. That's a silly idea, Dad. He thinks that man John Brown's behind every bush. Well, it's not that I mind so much. It's being away from you for six weeks just when we're getting started. Started? Where? Uh, look, I've only got a few minutes left, so I've got to be fast. You haven't been exactly slow for a couple of days. It never sees such a pair of whirlwinds as you and George Custer. Oh, George. Poor old George. Well, never mind about him. Look, kid, I might as well tell you before I go. I'm completely crazy about you. What? Uh, no, wait a minute. Let me finish. I needn't warn you about army life. The pay is bad. I'd never be home. You'd probably be a widow in two weeks. I see. Have you thought of any particular names for the children? No, be serious, will you? This might be the most precious moment in our lives. I hope not, not in these clothes. Haven't you got any heart at all? Yes, I have. And it's going to stay right where it is. I don't know a thing about you, Jeb Stewart. My brother thinks you're wonderful. Uh, but then he was dropped on his head when he was a baby. 
Santa Fe Trail was a historically based romance about Jeb Stewart, Kit Carson Holliday, and their friendship with George Custer during the events leading up to the Civil War. For this film, Reagan portrayed Custer, Errol played Jeb, and Olivia was Kit. By the way, how'd they ever come to name you Kit Carson Holliday? Well, Mr. Carson and my dad were very good friends, and they were so sure I was going to be a boy that they named me before I was born. Oh, I see. Well, I'm certainly glad they were wrong. Me too. Me too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but for their next picture together, Flynn was cast as General Custer, and De Havilland was his bride, Elizabeth, and they died with their boots on. Seventh Michigan, charge! Regiment the world has ever known, thundering to battle to the rousing tempo of their own fighting song, writing history with the flashing strokes of their sabers. Men who'd rather die with their boots on than see their flag crumpled in defeat. All under the flaming command of the man they'd follow straight to Hades, General George Custer. From amazing triumphs on Civil War battlefields to lightning attacks against the warring Indian tribes of Dakota's Black Hills, it's Errol Flynn in his greatest role, reliving the glorious adventures of America's Golden Cavalier, fighting side by side with the most colorful heroes ever to come out of West Point, General Sheridan, Ulysses S. Grant, Lee, General Winfield Scott, and in the picture you'll always remember her for, lovely Olivia de Havilland. I said, will you marry me when I'm a general? Oh, Lieutenant. Oh, it's easy to become a general. Then that old crab, to, I mean, that nice old father of yours will be proud of me. Yes, General. You know, if I was you, Mr. Sharp, I'd vamoose. Custer's liable to go loco about this. I'm not getting out. We, we opened by authority of the commissioner. The, uh... Drinks were free of the men in honor of his visit. I want my regiment back, Grant. Maybe you'll tell me why I should give it to you. I'll tell you why. Because you know how it is when a man's broken. When he's left behind and his regiment's marching out to fight. You know how he feels, Grant. Because you have a taste of it yourself. This would be Olivia's last film with Errol. When they met at a party a mere 10 years later, she failed to even recognize him. Flynn's self-destructive ways had wreaked havoc with the once good looks that had so enthralled his adoring leading lady. After they died with their boots on, Olivia was paired with a completely different kind of leading man in 1941. James Cagney wasn't the debonair romantic swashbuckler type. He was a spunky scrapper, known for his tough guy gangster roles. Playing opposite Cagney developed to Havlin's flip and feisty side for Strawberry Blonde. This is all right if it's all in fun. Even if it isn't fun. You mean? Exactly. Wouldn't you like a nice young man to marry you someday? Silly outmoded convention. Started by the caveman and uh, encouraged by the florists and jewelers. Well, wouldn't you like to have a home and kids? Oh, certainly I would, but that doesn't mean one has to go through all the... You mean... Exactly. This light romantic comedy took its title from a lyrical turn-of-the-century song. He's not scientific, but simply terrific when he's got these gals in his arms. It's just made for you, it's a... Jack Carson and wartime poster girl Rita Hayworth co-star. boy is terrific. She's all the fudge. Olivia was frustrated with her life at Warner Brothers, though she was nominated for an Academy Award for the film Hold Back the Dawn. But her own sister, Joan Fontaine, beat her to the punch, winning the Best Actress Oscar for 1941's Suspicion. Now de Havilland was really chomping at the bit, 
She demanded that Jack Warner give her juicier acting assignments and not continually typecast her in sweet roles. He responded by putting Olivia on a six-month suspension. When she did return to the screen, it was appropriate that she made a film about a heated rivalry between warring sisters. Olivia was cast opposite a most devious Betty Davis for In This, Our Life. You hated me ever since, since Peter. You can't stand the sight of me because you couldn't hold him. Stand And it's not only Peter, it's Craig, too. You're afraid I could get him back, and I could if I wanted him. All I have to do is lift my little finger, and that's why you're tormenting me. Because you're jealous and you're getting revenge. I'll go out and get what I want. The way Stan gets what she wants. I'm going to be like the Fitzroy's. They know how to live, and I'm going to be just as hard as they. There's nothing permanent but now, the moment. That's all there is. I'm not going to lose you. The only way you'll lose me is by trying to hold on to me. Never count on its lasting. And don't ask me to count on it. Keep away from me. I hate you. I hate everything about you. You and your righteous heirs. Why don't you go back to Roy where you belong? She's just fool enough to have you. De Havilland then found herself in a routine college football comedy called The Male Animal, opposite Henry Fonda. What happens when you two dance together that doesn't happen when we dance together. Olivia felt that things were bad enough, but then the studio extended her contract time due to her previous suspension. Something had to give. In 1986, de Havilland recalled the circumstances that led to her battle with Warner Brothers. Desperation. That's, that'll give you the courage every time. Well, uh, I just wanted to do good work. And to do good work, you've got to have good films and good roles that you are suited to and that you understand and that you love. And that wasn't happening at Warner's. Well, I served my whole seven years. She then resolved to sue her bosses. During the court battle, she didn't appear in a single film. The result was worth the wait. In a landmark decision, the judge declared that Olivia did not have to make up the lost time. Plus, performers were now to be limited to a seven-year contract, which would include any suspensions. This became known as the de Havilland Law. No longer could the studios treat performers as mere property to do with as they saw fit. Returning to the screen in 1946, Olivia made four films. To each his own concerned a small town girl who has an illegitimate son by a pilot. I'll be gone from here in three hours? I know you will. Well, isn't it pretty clear then? Love. Love the way you think about it. That's a lifetime job. I haven't any lifetime. But Jody has a lifetime and is dominated by a love that endures beyond a man's death, a child's birth, and another woman's jealousy. We could have been happy. Only you sit in my chair and sleep in my bed and put in the air I breathe. You're a man. One human being really loves me and needs me. My little boy, I'll never give him up to you. Never, never. The film delighted audiences and critics alike. Most importantly, de Havilland's performance finally brought her that elusive Oscar. Then, after being nominated for playing a woman suffering a mental breakdown in the snake pit, she won the coveted Academy Award a second time for her portrayal of Catherine Sloper in 1941's The Heiress. Everybody admits you are the most independent and strict jury of cinema critics in the world. That's why your award last year meant so much to me. And nobody, certainly not myself, could really have thought it would be my good fortune to be summoned again so soon. However, here I am, 
delighted and happy and very, very proud. Thank you. In the 1940s, Olivia gained both critical recognition and personal freedom. By the 1950s, she was beginning her transition from leading lady roles to character actress. That Lady was a costume drama and one of her last few romantic leading lady assignments. This time to Haviland was teamed opposite dashing Gilbert Rowland. I'm still a widow. But you're also a woman. Here are the intimate pages of a love story that the world discussed in guarded whispers. By the 60s, a new genre of horror movies was breathing life into the careers of stars left over from Hollywood's golden age. Replacing Joan Crawford, de Havilland joined fellow Warner Brothers veteran Betty Davis in one of the cream of the crop, Hush Hush, Sweet Charlotte. Now will you shut your mouth? Let me tell you, Miriam Deering, that murder starts in the heart. Why wouldn't I tell him that his pure, darling little girl was having a dirty little affair with a married man? You're a vile, sorry little trap! How would I to know it would end in murder? Afterwards, Olivia went on to make a couple of forgettable things, including working for her alma mater, Warner Brothers, in The Swarm. She resurfaced on television, bringing a bit of elegance and glamour to otherwise standard costume dramas and biopics. During the hoopla surrounding the 50th anniversary of Gone with the Wind, she graciously declined all interviews as the only surviving member of the four main stars. In her 80s, she enjoyed a quiet retirement in Paris, France. But she had a most remarkable career that spanned six decades. She began with early portrayals of supportive sweetness to gallant rescuers. Yet even in those roles, she showed underlying evidence of depth and determination. Ultimately, she rescued herself, blazing a trail for artistic freedom that changed the film industry forever. Hollywood will always remember Olivia de Havilland.